I want to show you how you go from using the Gram Schmidt process to uh, obtaining the QR decomposition, the QR factorization of a given matrix. Uh, so, but before I do, I need to explain a little bit uh, of things. So I've <clears throat> this time imported my slides into this, and I want to stress some uh, results that we've seen. Okay, so. <clears throat> In the QR factorization theorem uh, that I've uh, reminded you of here, uh, I'll uh, point out one very important component. So suppose you have a matrix A with linearly independent columns, then we can find this factorization. And the important word here that I'm going to highlight in red is orthonormal columns. Okay orthonormal, not orthogonal. I mean, orthogonal and normalized, okay? So the process uh, that we are going to, uh, to use to uh, obtain the QR factorization is, okay, we start out with a matrix. Um, maybe let me now switch to black. So we start out with a matrix A. Uh, we consider the columns of A. Uh, so, of course, we want the linearly independent columns. Uh, we take the columns of A as x1 to x uh, n here. We apply Gram-Schmidt to x1 to xn. That is going to give us a v1 to vn that are orthogonal if you don't do anything else. you'll just end up with orthogonal columns. Um, and if you want to make them uh, uh, orthonormal, normalize V1 to Vn to get of a normal set And then you have your matrix QR, the uh, Q, sorry. Then Q is the matrix that has columns V1 to Vn normalized. Okay, it's not just uh, V1 to Vn, it's the, ma the, the normalized V1 to Vn. Okay, another important point uh, that I uh, want to make. Uh, is that okay? So let me let me go back to this theorem. Uh, my my pen has become a little big. Um, so recall that we also need the R. You can see it here. Okay. So this theorem states that if uh, we have linearly independent uh, columns, and we, so we were able to uh, have a QR factorization of the matrix A then our least square solution is this quantity here. But this quantity here that you're uh, seeing, it involves R inverse. So not only do I need Q, I also need R inverse. So how do I get R inverse? So this is quite simple. And let me, uh, let me do the computation for you because it's really simple, as I said. So <clears throat> we know that if A has linearly independent uh, columns, then uh, A equals QR with Q having uh, what we were just discussing, uh, Q having 
of the normal columns of or normal columns. Okay. Well, if Q has all for normal columns, uh, that is IE, that is Q tie transpose times Q must be identity. Okay, that's the definition of a matrix that has all for normal columns. Well, if Q times Q transpose times Q is equal to identity, let me take, uh, I need to increase my size a little bit. I don't know why it's going from one to the other. Um, so take the equation A equals QR. And now multiply this equation on both sides by Q transpose. This is equivalent. Okay. I can do what I want. Why did I do it to both sides? Uh, Q transpose Q R. But from what we just remarked, Q transpose times Q is equal to identity. So that means this is equivalent to Q transpose A equals R. Okay. So once you have R, a Q, you transpose it, you multiply it by A, and you get your matrix R. Okay. So, uh, Let's, uh, where are we? Here, let me uh, go back to this uh, procedure. Uh, so we start out, uh, this is what we need to do to get the QR factorization. So we start out with A, we apply Grunschmidt to the columns of A to get our orthogonal uh, basis. Um, then we, uh, orthogonal columns, okay. Um, then um, it is only a basis if there are as many as the size of, uh, so I shouldn't say a basis, it's an orthogonal columns. Um, so uh, we get, so take your matrix A, apply Gram-Schmidt to the columns, get orthogonal columns, normalize, get orthonormal columns and put them in Q. So let's go back to the examples we did the other day, the very simple examples. Um, so I'll remind you that with that, that first really simply, simplistic example, um, I actually ended up, and if you look at it here, if I take this order, I'm going to get something that is trivial. So maybe I won't do this one because if you look, if you remember, here we got V1 equal to 1, 0, and V2 equal to 0, 1. So that means if we put these uh, vectors in Q, we get the identity matrix. So everything is way simpler than it will be in general. So let's instead look at, uh, if you recall, what we then did is that we l switched the order of the columns. We looked at one, one, uh, one, zero, and we found that um, the uh, uh, the equivalent was uh, well, the, pro uh, the result of applying Gram Schmidt was one, one, half, and minus a half. So let's uh, let's process this example here. So the matrix A is one, 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 zero. And we found that, so that was x1 equals to 1, 1, x2 equal to 1, 0. We applied Gram-Schmidt to get v1 equal to, this doesn't change, okay, 1, 1. And we found v2 equals to a half and minus a half. So we've applied the first step. Uh, now, what 
Uh, are these vectors normalized? Well, clearly not. Uh, I mean, uh, once you've played with them enough, you, uh, you know what they are, but let's do the computation. Uh, so the norm of V1 is equal to the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared. So that's square root 2. So how do I normalize V1? Well, I simply need, let's call it V1 bar, for instance. Uh, I simply need to divide by the norm. Okay, so this is 1 over square root 2 times V1. So that means my vector V1 bar, my normalized vector, is 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2. Likewise, v2, sorry, has norm square root of one fourth plus one fourth. Okay, I take the square of both components. Of course, when I square minus a half, I get one fourth the same way. So that's uh, square root of one half, i.e. one over square root two. So, same again, I'm going to use a vector v2, let's say with a bar, for instance, it doesn't really matter. That is simply v2, v2 sorry, divided by 1 over square root 2. Uh, that is equivalent to multiplying v2 by square root 2. And so v2, this doesn't look good should really look, sorry, sometimes my tablet does this, uh, but okay, so I multiply uh, the components of V2 by square root two, so I find square root two over two and minus square root two over two. Now, these vectors, V1 bar and V2 bar are the vectors, so let Q, that are the vectors that I'm going to put in Q. So. I'll denote it like this first, v1 bar, v2 bar, and that is r equal to, uh, so first vector is 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2. Second vector is square root 2 over 2 minus square root 2 over 2. Okay, so we now want the R matrix. So to get R, so recall that what we are doing is uh, we get R by taking Q transpose times A. Okay. So R equals Q transpose times A. Q transpose is the matrix uh, that I just wrote transposed, so uh, exchange rows for columns. So I get 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2, uh, square root 2 over 2, and minus square root 2 over 2. And I multiply this by my matrix A, which uh, is uh, here on the top left, 1, 0, 1, uh, one, one, one 0. And recall that there's a reality check that should happen now. So 1, 1, 1, 0. And it is that another component of the result uh, on uh, the matrix uh, QR is here. Uh, it's that the matrix R is non-singular, okay, upper triangular. So that matrix needs to be upper triangular, so it should have zeros below the diagonal, and it should also be non-singular. And I'll remind you something we saw about uh, triangular matrices in general. Uh, there's an equivalent condition to uh, an upper, a triangular matrix being invertible. It is that none of the diagonal entries are zero. So let's see if we do get this. Let's go back to here. Let's carry out the computation. 
Okay, so this is, uh, okay, uh, 1 over square root 2 plus 1 over square root 2 is 2 over square root 2. Uh, the upper, upper right term is 1 over square root 2. Uh, in the lower left, that one should be 0. And indeed, where it's square root 2 over 2 minus square root 2 over 2, which is indeed 0. And the last entry is square root 2 over 2. So this checks, okay, this uh, matrix R here. Uh, that we obtained is indeed upper triangular and its diagonal entries are non-zero. So it is an invertible and non-singular uh, upper triangular matrix. And just to check that we've done things properly, uh, let us uh, carry out the computation R Q times R to check. So just to check, Q times R is equal to, okay, matrix Q is uh, 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2, square root 2 over 2, minus square root 2 over 2. Matrix R is the matrix we just computed, 2 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2, 0, square root 2 over 2 and that product okay so first um, first uh, one one entry let's put it that way is 2 over square root 2 I'll do the computation slowly 2 over square root 2 uh, I'm normally I, I I shift my matrices to do the computation, so I'm trying to to do this without uh, shifting, and I am not having a lot of success. Uh, where am I? Uh, this is two over sorry two over square root two times square root two. My gosh, which is uh, one. Um, the one two entry is uh, is what? Uh, okay, let let me show you while we're at this uh, how I normally do my computations. Um, so let let's uh, let's uh, move on to the next page. I don't know if I can copy this to the next page, but let me uh, let me briefly. Uh, explain how I do computations because it might be useful to you sometimes. Uh, okay, so I want to compute QR as the product and what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift the matrices around so that I can uh, see them uh, in a better way. So I'll take the matrix that I'm multiplying on the left by and shift it down a bit. Uh, so it's 1 over square root 2 um, 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2, minus, okay, where am I, uh, square, square root 2 over 2, minus square root 2 over 2, okay, and I'll write the matrix R, that I, so the matrix on the right of the product, I'll write it here. Uh, instead of writing them side to side. Okay, and R is 2 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2, square root 2, 2 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2, and square root 2 over 2, yes. And 0. Okay, and to get my result, I simply need then to go down, let me uh, use the color, I can match this row, this column and this row and to get the 1-1 one, one entry. And then I can match this first row with this second column to get the 1-2 entry and so on and so forth.
Okay, so you can see what's happening. Uh, this is just my uh, trick from, I mean, not trick, but this is how we learn to do it uh, when we're students. Uh, okay, so when I'm doing this, I get uh, 2 over square root 2 times 1 over square root 2. So that's 2 over square root 2 squared. That's a 1. Then the 1, 2 entry, I go down that uh, second column in the right matrix and first row in the first matrix. So this is 1 over square root 2 times 1 over square root 2. That's a half. Uh, plus square root 2 squared over 2. And that's also a half. So that's a 1. Uh, the, this and this is giving me uh, 2 over square root 2 squared, which is a 1. And lastly, let me try to erase that little tiny one without this. And the last uh, entry is 1 over square root 2 squared. So that's a half minus a half. So that's zero. And this is indeed A. So that checks. Okay. <laughs> so apparently I can't pause recording. I was hoping to pause. Uh, let me now go to, uh, to show you a sort of a, a not as uh, trivial example. Let's look at problem three in assignment two. Uh, which I'll remind you is, uh, takes this form, A is the matrix 3, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, and B was the vector 1, 1, 1. Okay, suppose you uh, want to do the, um, you want to solve this, uh, this least squares problem, okay, AX equals B. Uh, and I'm just going to go to the process of getting the QR uh, decomposition. I'm not going to go to solve the problem itself, but I'll let you check as an exercise that it does uh, work. Um, okay, so uh, the columns of A, and I really want you to state this because it shows that you're checking the conditions of applications, of applications, sorry, of the results you're using. So the columns of A are linearly independent, and that is obvious because I can do whatever I want to my first column, I'm never going to transform it into the second column. Because if, for example, if I wanted to transform the last entry into a two, I'd multiply by two, but so I'd end up with a six and a two doesn't work, okay? So the columns of A are linearly independent. And uh, so our uh, vectors uh, that we're going to start out with are the vectors x1, equals to 3, 1, 1, and x2 equal to 1, 1, 2. We apply Gram-Schmidt, so we can do this because the columns are linearly independent, and we know that we're going to find a result. So we apply Gram-Schmidt. Let's start out. Uh, so V1, I remind you that what we start by doing is just taking x1. So that's 3, 1, 1. V2, I then project x2 onto the subspace that is spanned by x1, and I consider the perpendicular component, well, the, uh, so the, uh, the component of the projection orthogonal to this. So V2 is equal to x2 minus V1 dot x2 
divided by, let's write it as v1 dot v1. We could also write norm of v1 squared uh, times v1. And that equals, uh, so x2 is the vector 1, 1, 2. I subtract from it, the, so v1 is 3, 1, 1 dot x2, 1, 1, 2 divided by v1 times v1. So 3, 1, 1 dot 3, 1, 1. And that whole thing is timed by v1, which is 3, 1, 1. Okay, so, uh, so I get 1, 1, 2 minus, so that dot product is 3 times 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 1 times 2, so that's 3, uh, 3, 4, 6, uh, and uh, divided by 9 and 1 and 1, so that's 6 11 times 3, 1, 1, which, uh, let's go to the next page, uh, so V2 equals, uh, let me copy, 1, 1, 2, Minus six eleven of uh, of who three one one, and that equals uh gosh this is ugly um this is one one two minus uh, what do we get we get eighteen over eleven uh six over eleven and six over eleven okay uh. Uh, 20, uh, 11 minus 8, uh, 11 minus 18 is minus 7, 11, um, oh, uh, crap, sorry, shoot, uh, where am I, 6, 11, yeah, no, no, that's good, uh, okay, uh, 11 minus 6 is 5, 11, and the last one is 22 minus 6 is 16 11. So we have v1 equal to 1, uh, 1, 1, 2. No, where am I? v1 is 3, 1, 1, sorry. <laughs> 3, 1, 1, and v2 equal to uh minus 7 11 5 11 and 16 16 11. okay so uh if we want to compute these norms then the right one is going to be uh, atrocious okay this looks if if i have to carry through 11th and so on and so i'll just point out what we need is a direction, not uh, a value, because what we are going to end up doing anyway is taking the normalized vector corresponding to v2 and v1. So for v1, the computation are easy. Uh, let's uh, let us scale uh, v2 so that we get. Let me point it out to get a vector parallel to v2 but more manageable in terms of number okay so what am i going to do well i'm going to get rid of those 11. i just need to say let me consider a v2 hat perhaps so i'll take v1 equal to 3 1 1 and a v2 hat which is 11 times v2 that vector is clearly in the same direction it's parallel to v2 but it's actually much nicer to deal with uh, minus 7 5 and 16. Okay, so I stress, at this point, it's not really important because anyway, what you're going to end up doing is dividing V2 or V2 hat by the norm of V2 
or V2 hat. So you might as well make your life easy at each stage. Uh, V1, the norm of V1 equals, okay, square root of uh, 3 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared, so that's square root 11. The norm of V2 hat is, oh gosh, that is still ugly, uh, the square root of 7 squared plus 5 squared plus 16 squared. Did I get 16? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, this is, uh, okay. 16 squared is, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I need to compute. Uh, this is square root of 49 plus 20, uh, 25 plus uh, 16 squared is uh, 16 times 16. I'll, I'll, uh, confess that I am a very bad uh, computational person. Uh, 6 times 6 is 36. Um, 36 uh, 6 times 1 is 6 and 3 is 9. Uh, 1 times 6 is uh, 16. So we get 6, 5, uh, 256, which I should have known. It's a very recognizable number. Okay, um, so that's 256, and that sum is ugly. Uh, 256 and 49 is uh, 265, uh, 305, 305, and uh, 25 is 310, 330. Okay, modulo potential computational mistakes, uh, we get that we can take the vector V1 tilde equal to uh, 1 over square root 11 times 311 and V2 tilde equal 1 over square root 330 times the vector minus 7, the 7, sorry, 5 and 16. So these give us Q. So Q is 3 over square root 11, 1 over square root 11, 1 over square root 11, minus 7, over square root 330. I could simplify that square root, but never mind. 5 over square root 330 and 16 over square root 330. So I am going to stop inflicting harm on myself and stop here. You would compute R. as the transpose of this times your original matrix. Okay. Okay, for our last exploration of QR-related uh, topics for the moment, we are going to take a look at using the QR uh, factorization in practice and how to do it using R. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to revisit our example of fitting the Canadian census data using the QR uh, procedure. So I've uh, created another worksheet that I will put online, uh, which uh, takes the worksheet we had before I am looking at, uh, let me see, get full screen. Uh, so I am uh, going to consider, uh, well, make the difference with what we had before. So I've, uh, I've revamped the sheet a little bit. I've 
aggregated everything in the same place. So I remember, remind you that there is this, uh, this file that we made and just a remark in passing, uh, for future, uh, assignments. It's very important if you are making a file like we did here, that is going to reside locally on your uh, CDG uh, folder, you need to, uh, when you're handing back the assignments, you need to recreate that file because otherwise you need to send me that file as well. And that is typically complicated. Uh, it's much easier for me if all of you, instead of uh, trying to transmit another file with your assignment, just make the file here. So in practice here, we would probably have the whole worksheet together with the worksheet that made the data. Okay, I would concatenate both. But here I can do that. And you, if you've run the worksheet that I used to create the Canada census, then you also have that data. So uh, but we're loading the data, we're plotting that data, and we get this thing that we had uh, already seen. Uh, I'll remind you what we did. So first of all, we used least squares uh, in the traditional way that we looked at, and we saw that this least squares problem had a unique solution. And um, we get this line uh, that it's through the data. Then we tried to do the same thing using uh, a quadratic, but the problem that we encountered when we were uh, performing the computation uh, in a sort of classic way with a quadratic is that the matrix A, which involves this x squared here, ended up having very, very large entries because we were squaring 2000, uh, taking the sum of the squares of these years, but ends up being a large number. And we ended up with this massive determinant. Um, and if you remember, one of the ways to compute the, uh, the inverse is one over the determinant times the adjoint of A. Well, you can imagine that when I have a determinant that is that large, one over it is very small. Uh, and so we have this problem of condition number being very small. Um, well, the reciprocal of a condition number. Uh, and that means that the matrix is almost singular. So the method fails. When we try to invert the matrix, uh, we cannot, uh, the, the program fails. So what we did as a first solution uh, was to shift the data because the diagnosis is that when I'm squaring, I'm taking the sum of the square of numbers from 1850 to something large, uh, I am getting something very large and etc. So what we did is we shifted the years back to zero at the beginning. Uh, and that took us forward to about 150. And those numbers were much more manageable. And this was the object of, for instance, your assignment two. Um, and so you get a number that actually works. Uh, and we did this. Uh, so we have the first red line, which corresponds to fitting the line. Uh, and then we have the blue curve, which corresponds to fitting a quadratic. We are quite happy. Uh, we did this uh, not plotting the axis and then shifting the, well, plotting the axis, but shifted. Um, this works well, but now let's look at the QR factorization. So in R, there's probably other functions that do it, but there's a native base function QR because the QR factorization is used a lot in statistics. So QR is a base function of R. Um, now the function is simply called QR. Um, and you invoke it by, and so here I've stored my result in a, in a matrix, but I've called, well, not a matrix, 
I'll get to that in a second, in a list that I've called QR, uh, and you simply invoke it by uh, saying QR of A. And I remind you that A is indeed the matrix that corresponds to not the, uh, not the line problem. Uh, so here I should have called them A1 and A2. Maybe let me do this just uh, to make things clear. Uh, this is A1. And here, okay, so this is the matrix that corresponds to fitting the line. And A2 is the matrix that, uh, okay, where am I? I should say ATA2, but here it doesn't matter because, uh, oh, yes, and here I should say this is ATA1 inverse ATA1, solve ATA1, inverse ATA1. Um, okay, that still works, of course. Um, and here ATA2, I still have the same problem. Uh, so here, uh, blah, 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 ATA L. Uh, oh yes, here I've given them different names, L for line and Q for quadratic, so I'm good here. Uh, but let's go back to the original problem. So this is A2, okay? Now, if, as I said, it's very simple to apply the, the procedure. Uh, everything that we've spent quite some time doing by hand, uh, R does really, really quickly. But it's important to know how to do both, okay? Um, so QR, as I pointed out, is not uh, as simple as it sounds. So there's a bunch of return values that I'm not going to explain all in detail. I'm just going to point out that the value QR, so this is how I would get access to only this, okay? It's a matrix, etc. But when you look at the help, uh, so I thought I had the help. Uh, yes, maybe I should do things in the other way. Um, so I'll, I'll switch the order when I post this. Uh, the, that value, I can use it directly to find the, problem, the solution to the least squares problem. But if my first interest is to find the matrix Q and the matrix R in the decomposition, I don't get it right away. So here, what I've done is I've uh, looked for the help of the function QR. Uh, and uh, part of the help actually mentions this here. In the return value of QR, QR, so that's QR dollar QR, contains a matrix that has the same dimension as X, X being the matrix, okay? Um, the upper triangle, contains the R of a decomposition. So what's that, that is telling me is that, so what they call the upper triangle is this guy, okay? The three, uh, so the matrix is not square, but you can still think of something going down the diagonal, except that the diagonal ends up being this entry here. Um, so that's what the upper triangle is. So the upper triangle contains the matrix R and the lower triangle, so anything that's below this diagonal contains information on the Q decomposition stored in compact form. And so when you see this, you don't know how to use it directly, but there are two functions that you can use on the result. And I'll stress this, you have to first compute the result, so you have to apply QR, a function QR to a matrix. When you use that result, then you can use QR.Q and QR.R. And guess what they do? QR.Q gives you the Q matrix and QR.R gives you the R matrix. And you could do it directly. I mean, you could also say QRQ of a, of a decomposition of A. And I should stress this is A2 here. And then when I do this, then I get my results. So this is a matrix Q. 
And this is the matrix R. Okay. Uh, just to check that matrix Q, I've stored the names as Q and R. Okay. That matrix Q, I want my columns to form an orthonormal basis, an orthonormal set, sorry. Uh, so they are going to form an orthonormal set if their norm is equal to one each and if they're pairwise orthogonal. So let's check this. And I'll point out that there's an, a problem in assignment three that could use some of what I'm going to do in the next uh, line. So the first one that I want to check is that the norm of each column is equal to one. And this is very simple. So in R, when I have a matrix and I use just the uh, power uh, notation, this is not the square of the matrix in the usual sense. As usual, R is a little weird with matrix notations. So this is the square, the matrix that contains the square of the entries of Q, okay? which in our case here is really useful because if I take Q squared, then I get the matrix where each of the entries here are squared. And then I can use the function call sums, which as you can guess, sums the columns uh, to get the sum of each column. And I can see that when I do call sums of Q squared, so of uh, the entries in the square, I get one, one, one. Okay, so this is nice. We know that the matrix has, uh, uh, the, uh, the columns have a norm one, so this has produced the result we want. Um, and now let's check pairwise orthogonality. So this should remind you of in assignment three, which perhaps you haven't looked at these notes yet and you'll be a little frustrated, but I also don't want to uh, give out the solutions right away. Um, if you're looking at assignment three, you're asked to check linear independence. That would be about the same as what we are going to do. What we want to see here is that we have orthogonality. Uh, so let's check this. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare column by column in Q and check that the uh, columns are orthogonal. So how many columns? I can just write that this is the dimension of Q along the second dimension. So the first dimension being the number of rows and the second uh, dimension being the number of columns. And I'm going to use this nice function that I mentioned in the hints uh, to assignment three, which is comb n, which is going to give me all the two, the combinations of, in this case, two, uh, two entries in this vector. So one to n call is going to be the vector one to three, okay? Because in this case that we're looking at, uh, Q has three columns and it's going to produce a matrix that has each column has a different combination. So if I want to do the pairwise comparisons of three columns, I have to compare column one and column two, column one and column three, and column two and column three. Once I've done this, I know I have checked all possible pairs and that's it. So I am now going to do the following. I'm going to make first an empty vector, and this is a way to make one, okay? I just start with C. C concatenates entries into a vector. That can be anything, okay? But here I'm going to put numbers in there, of course. Um, so I start with an empty uh, vector, and then for each entry in this matrix here, each column in this matrix, so this is the dimension of a pair of columns uh, two. So that's this dimension here. Uh, I am going to take the dot product. So of Q um, of the first, the column that's indicated here and the column that's indicated here. Okay, so one, two. When I equals two, I'm comparing one, three. 
and when i equals three i'm comparing two and three and what i do is i add this to this vector that started at empty so what i'm i'm sort of recursively adding to the vector it's actually not recursive but you see the idea uh, i start with the empty vector and then i say okay take the empty vector and add that re first result when i is one and then the next time around i'm taking the vector where i now have one entry and i'm adding the result of this when i is two and third time i'm adding the result where i is three and when i plot sorry display this result uh what i get is this number so you look at this and you're thinking ouch this doesn't look like uh, these vectors are orthogonal. And I'll just make a remark. So here I have an e to the minus 17. Here I have an e to the minus 16 and an e to the minus 17. And if you look at the components of the vectors, they're quite large. I mean, they're not of the order of 10 to the minus 5 or, uh, sorry, 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 12 and things like this. So when I'm multiplying vectors like this, entries like this, that are at the 10 to the minus 1 or 10 to the minus 2, and that the overall result is very close to 0, I can assume that this is a numerical imprecision. Okay, the problem would be if I had, if my entries in the matrix Q uh, were 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 14, and I'm playing with this, I would have to be much more careful. But here, I've got something which I'm, I'm summing products of things that have order 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2, and I still get something whose sum is very close to zero. Doesn't matter that they're negative or positive, okay? These are small computational mistakes. So this tells me that the columns are pairwise orthogonal. Okay, I can assume that these are, are zero uh, to a numerical imprecision, uh, and therefore the columns are pairwise orthogonal. Now, let's go back to our problem. So we found the Q and the R. Uh, let me just point out that it's so frequently used in R that there is a method that has been defined when the result is a, the result of a QR uh, function, of using the QR function, then if you use solve with an object that has been created by this function, it solves the quadratic equation. Okay. Uh, uh, not the quadratic, sorry. It solves the, uh, the least squares problem. So here, when I use QRB. This is not what I should be using. What I should be using is the formula that we obtained. Um, when, uh, so uh, when, when uh, we solve for the QR, so that's R inverse QT times B. But the function does it automatically. Okay, so if I do this, I get a solution. And here, Notice that I am back to not shifted values of x, okay? Because I haven't had to shift to use the QR uh, code. And not so you can check that this is not x new anywhere. This is the, these are the values are the values of x, so 1851 to 2011. Um, and, uh, and you can see that the blue curve, which is the one we just solved using the QR method, uh, the blue curve works perfectly. 